Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Uh, inshallah, uh, the brothers in the back, inshallah, come to the front room. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, inshallah, if everybody can uh, settle down from the back. <coughs> Alright, so tonight, alhamdulillah, this is uh, part 14 in our description of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The chapter that we'll do today, or tonight, it's the chapter on the laughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, the first hadith that we have, Jabir ibn Samura radiallahu anhu, uh, this is a hadith from a tirmidhi he said that كان في ساق رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حموشة that the shins of the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم were were thin and وكان لا يضحك إلا تبسما and he would not laugh except by smiling. So his laughter was simple smiling. And as uh, Jabir radiallahu anhu says, Jabir ibn Samura, that إِذَا نَذَرْتُ إِلَيْهِ أَكْحَلُ الْعَيْنَيْنِ And whenever I saw him, it would look like his, his, as if his eyes had kuhl. But, وَلَيْسَ بِأَكْحَلْ But his eyes did not have the kuhl. But this is how naturally the Prophet Sallallahu eyes were. So in relation to the chapter that we're discussing tonight, we see here that, uh, but just before that, that of course one of their physical attributes that the Prophet Sallallahu had thin shins. And this was just his physical attribute. Now the more important point here that وَكَانَ لَا يَضْحَكُ إِلَّا تَبَسُّمًا He did not laugh except by smiling. The Prophet wasallam, whenever he laughed, he never used to laugh in a noisy manner that we laugh today. Right? This was not from the adab of Rasulullah wasallam. He would be moderate in his affairs. He was moderate in everything. In the way he ate, in the way he dressed, in the way he lived. Right? Every aspect of life, he was balanced and moderate. So same thing when it came to laughing. No, no, no. Rather we have from the Prophet Sallallahu himself, <laughs> yes, yes, you have to be quiet. <laughs> the kids running around saying no, no. Right? <laughs> so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to laugh even moderately. It would be a smile. And he also said, and the scholars have mentioned this past and present, and this is something that is very important. A lot of times we don't understand this, especially in this day and age with the viral videos. Something is hilarious. It spreads right, like wildfire, millions of views. When you laugh too much, it kills your heart. This is from Islam. Laughing too much kills your heart. People just lose the seriousness of life. As Muslims, as believers, we have something far greater to look forward to than this dunya life, which is the life in the Akhir, which we hope, inshallah ta'ala, is in Jannah. That we have to live a balanced life. Life is not about joking and la'ib, right? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has criticized, that many people, they take the dunya life as just an amusement. And beautification and amusement, they're not serious about their hereafter. So the Prophet ﷺ would make sure that he stayed balanced. If you're laughing all day long, every single day, looking at funny things, it's not haram to look at funny things. And we shall see that very next chapter that the Prophet ﷺ himself used to joke around. So we'll discuss that as well tonight. But the point is that if you are busy laughing all the time, 
it kills your heart. Right? So this is not from the way of the Prophet wasallam. So the Prophet wasallam, there are other ahadith as we shall see in a few minutes. When he would laugh, his smile would be so big that you could see the molar teeth, the teeth at the back. Right? So it was a full smile, full laugh. And if you take in all the ahadith together, you would understand something about the Prophet ﷺ. When it came to issues of the dunya, he would smile. When it came to issues of the akhirah, he would laugh. That was how the Prophet ﷺ would be distinguished between his laugh and his smile. Smile, of course, he always had a smile on his face. Even we know from the hadith, like for example in Sahih Muslim, even smiling at your brother, or a Muslima smiling at her sister, even the smile that you give to your fellow Muslim, this is a sadaqah, insha'Allah. Just smiling at your fellow Muslim, you get an ajr from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So smiling is from the sunnah. You have to smile at each other, right? Especially in this masjid, a lot of times, people don't even give salam to each other, right? This is horrible. This is really horrible. So you must smile, you must... Uh, just happened to me and brother Islam today after Asr. Both of us stuck our hand out to a brother, right? I'm the Imam, he's a brother praying with us. We both stuck our hands out to one guy to give salam. He ignored both of us and just walked out. <laughs> so th this is, I mean, we're laughing about it, but this is horrible, right? As a Muslim, you cannot be uh, this way. So smile at your fellow Muslim, this is a sadaqa. The Prophet ﷺ would smile in relation to the dunya, and he would laugh in relation to the akhir. The Prophet uh, Abdullah ibn al-Harith radiallahu anhu, he said in a hadith that's collected in a tirmidhi, that ma ra'aytu ahadan akthara tabassuma min, min Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I have not seen anyone smile more than Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He always had a pleasant face. You would not know that he was probably starving last night. You would not know that he has lost his son, right? He would always have a smile on his face when he meets the other Muslims, when he met with his community. So here is Abdullah ibn al-Harith giving this description that he never saw the Messenger وسلم, except with a smile on his face. So this is how we as Muslims have to be. That when we see each other, we have to be pleasant, we put a smile, we look friend friendly, we look approachable, and we must be friendly and approachable. Now the Prophet wasallam, in another hadith, that's in Sahih Muslim, Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu narrates this hadith. And now we see the difference of his smile and laughter. So in that hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he made it clear that he said, إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ أَوَّلَ رَجُلٍ يَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةِ وَآخَرَ رَجُلٍ يَخْرُجُ مِنَ النَّارِ Indeed, I have been informed about the absolute last person who will be entering into paradise. The very first one and the very last one. Right? Who will be the absolute last person to leave Jahannam and enter paradise. So this is how he started off with. And later on, we'll uh, look at the hadith that talks about the specific person that he's referring to. But in this hadith, he mentioned that, but then he talked about a separate type of man on the Day of Judgment. He mentioned that يُؤْتَى بِالرَّجُلِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامِ A man will come on the Day of Judgment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is of course judging us all. So this man will come in front of Allah on the Day of Judgment. فَيُقَالُوا إِعْرِضُوا عَلَيْهِ صِغَارَ ذُنُوبِهِ وَيُخَبَّأَ عَنْهُ كِبَارُهَا All his minor sins will be placed in front of him. And his major sins will be hidden from him. So Allah brings this person, a Muslim, all his minor sins are placed in front of him. The major sins are hidden away by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It still hasn't shown up. And then, فَيُقَالُوا لَهُ And Allah will tell this person, 
Amilta yawma kada wa kada kada. On such and such day, you did such and such action. Going through his book of records, all the minor sins placed in front of him, one by one, one by one. On such and such day, you said this. On such and such day, you did this. Wahua muqirrun la yunkiru. And this man, he does not deny a single thing. He accepts, he attests to everything that is being said to him. On such and such day you did this and said this. Yes. On such and such day you did this and did, said this. Yes. He is not denying, he will not deny a single one of his minor sins. Right? A single one of his minor sins. Then, وَهُوَ مُشْفِقٌ مِنْ كِبَارِهَا all the while, as he is affirming all these minor sins, the whole time in the back of his head, he is severely stressed out. These are just my minor sins. The major sins are yet to come. So he is anxious. He is filled with stress. So he's accepting his minor sins, but at the same time, he's thinking about what's going to happen when the major sins are brought in front of him. فَيُقَالُوا then Allah will tell this person, uh, this person, that أَعْتُوهُ مَكَانَ كُلِّ سَيِّئَةٍ عَمِلَهَا حَسَنَةٍ Every minor sin that you see, that you have done, it will be erased and placed with one good deed. So all your minor sins, for each minor sin, it's being erased right now and is being replaced by a good deed. So when this man sees that Allah tells him this, then he says, "Inna li dunuban ma araha hahuna." I have more bad deeds that I don't see here. <laughs> right? So he sees the mercy of Allah. So then he says, he's thinking. Now he's not anxious anymore. He's relieved. So he says, "I have more bad deeds." So he can be replaced. Allah will replace them and wipe them out and replace them with good deeds. Qala Abu Dhar, now he's the one who's narrating this hadith. He says that as the Prophet ﷺ was saying this sentence about this man, فَلَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ ضَحِكَ حَتَّى بَدَتْ نَوَاجِدُهُ He laughed so big that we could see his molar teeth. Just like how we bursted out laughing because this was about the akhirah. So he would laugh. What an, I mean, this is such a pleasant, funny story that this will happen to a person. He will come on the day of judgment filled with minor sins, major sins, all kinds of sins. And he is worried, sweating. But then Allah is giving him information that your minor sins are being wiped out. With each one is being given a good deed. And this is from the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Furqan that إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَآمَنَ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنًا For those who make tawbah, for those who sincerely repent to Allah, his bad deeds, his sayyi'ah, his minor sins, it will be changed to hasanat. Subhanallah. Right? So if you fall into a sin, immediately you make tawbah to Allah. This becomes a good deed. But of course, we won't know if the tawbah got accepted or not. Right? So this man, he shows up on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. He used to make tawbah for his mistakes, but he had no idea, just like none of us have any clue, if our repentance is being accepted or not. But we will find out on the Day of Judgment. So then he realizes that his tawbah from the dunya got accepted. So then he keeps saying, there's more bad deeds than I did. You know, and he knows that he made tawbah to Allah. And Allah is accepting all of those repentance and is wiping out each of those bad deeds, replacing it with a good deed, replacing it with a good deed. So here we see a clear example of the Prophet ﷺ that he laughed so big, his smile was so big that the, the Sahabi Abu Dhar, he saw his molar teeth. So in regards to dunya, he would have a pleasant smile on his face all the time. In regards to aspects of the akhirah, he would laugh so much with information like this that you could see his molar teeth. 
جاب جرير بن عبد الله رضي الله عنه in a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim he said that from the day ما حجبني رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم منذ أسلمت from the day that I accepted Islam ما حجبني meaning the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم did not screen himself from me any time I wanted to visit the Prophet any time I wanted to walk in on him as he's sitting with other companions he would never prevent me he would always let me sit with him even though he was busy with somebody else he would let me come and sit with him and I never saw him except that he had a smile on his face. Jarir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu, as the scholars have mentioned, he accepted Islam about 40 days before the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that was enough for him to realize or understand the character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In just 40 days he has uh, collected and narrated uh, a few hadith. So in a different uh, version of this hadith, uh, he made it clear that uh, That since the day I accepted Islam, I have never seen the Prophet except that he had a smile on his face. So that's what he meant by laughing and the smile. So the Prophet ﷺ, because he is a new Muslim, right? He's a new Muslim, somebody became Muslim, even though he's busy with somebody else, the Prophet would let Jarir sit down and learn from him. Have some questions, we'll answer you. This is how we have to be with people who are serious. Right? This is from the Sunnah. That many times we'll find people, they waste our time. They're not really interested in knowledge. No matter what you tell them, it goes to one ear, comes out the other. They're wasting your time. There's other serious people available waiting to learn this, that. But if somebody is serious, even though you're discussing something, it's okay. Like let's say if me and Brother Khalid are discussing something, one of you wants to come, you can ask, are you discussing something private? If not, let me benefit from the question and answer too. This is completely fine. Any opportunity that you get to increase in knowledge, you should take it, right? So Jarir radiallahu anhu would be the same way. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa never refused him. Anytime he wanted to sit, even though the Prophet sitting with somebody else, having a Q&A or discussion, he would make sure he would sit there try to benefit from the knowledge as much as possible. And the Prophet ﷺ always gave him permission. And he never refused. And uh, of course, that he always saw the Prophet ﷺ with a smile on his face. In another hadith that's collected in Bukhari and Muslim, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu is the narrator of this hadith. The Messenger ﷺ he said the same statement as the hadith of Abu Dhar, that inni la'alamu akhira ahlin nar, ahlin nari khurujan, khurujan minha. And wa akhira ahlin jannati dukhulan. That indeed I am aware, or I have been given the information, I know about the very last person who will be leaving the fire and entering into paradise. Now in this hadith, he describes this person. This is the absolute last person to come out of Jahannam. And this is the aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. It is clear from the Quran and from the Sunnah that as a Muslim, as long as someone is a Muslim, a muwahid, a person of Tawheed, right? That's the condition. He has to be a person of Tawheed, not a person of Shirk. He died upon Tawheed. He died upon with the basics of Islam. But he had a lot of sins. He will be punished in Jahannam for a period known to Allah. The more the sins, the more, longer the time. But eventually the person will be taken out of Jahannam and be put into paradise through eternity. Right? This is the difference between us as Ahlul Sunnah and the Khawarij. The Khawarij are the people of Al-Qaeda. Daesh, meaning ISIS, and all these other people, right? These extremists. Even though a Muslim may commit a major sin, like zina, drinking alcohol, stealing, whatever may be the case, but the person is still a Muslim, meaning he has his salah, he's a man of tawheed, he doesn't fall into shirk, there is still hope for this person that inshallah, eventually, the person will be forgiven, taken out of Jahannam, and placed into paradise. 
A Muslim, a Muwahid, will never ever be in Jahannam through eternity. Only the Kafir and the Munafiq, they are the ones who will stay in Jahannam forever, never come out. But a Muslim, even the worst one, will eventually come out. But he, the condition is, he has to have his basic Islam, which is Tawheed, Salah. Okay? <coughs> so the Prophet ﷺ is talking about the absolute last Muslim to come out of Jahannam. The absolute last one. So this man, he comes out of the fire, and as the Prophet wasallam, he said, that رَجُلٌ يَخْرُجُ مِنَ النَّارِ كَبْوًا He comes out of the fire crawling. He's burnt, his skin's torn off, and only Allah knows how many thousands of years he's been in the fire, right? So he's just coming out crawling. Allah gave him permission that that's it, his punishment is finished. He has been atoned for his sins, so he is now coming out. The very last person. After him, there is no more other person who will come out of Jahannam. And no more person who will enter paradise after him. So he comes out crawling, all bruised and cut up and burnt. Right? So, فَيَقُولُ اللَّهُ Allah will say to this man after he crawls out of the hellfire, اِذْهَبْ فَادْخُلِ الْجَنَّةِ Go and enter paradise. Right? Go and enter paradise. So this person, فَيَأْتِيهَا فَيُخَيَّلُ إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهَا مَلْآ So this person, he crawls. He goes out. He's going towards Jannah. He's imagining that, you know, I'm the last guy to come out of the fire. Maybe there's no space for me. He's thinking in dunya terms, right? In this earth, space is limited. Like even this masjid. For Juma, we get like up to 500 people. But if another 100 came, there is no space. Or even if another 20 came, they have to pray, pray outside in the street, which is what happens in the summertime, right? Everywhere you go, space is limited. So he's still thinking in terms of his dunya life. That okay, Allah has told me to go to Jannah. Everybody already went. There's no space for me. I'm the last guy to come out, right? So he goes back to Allah and فَيَرْجِعُوا فَيَقُولُوا يَا رَبِّي وَجَدْتُهَا مَلْأَ My Lord, I went, but I see that it's full. He didn't even check properly. He just, you know, assumed that I'm the last person to come out. Surely there's no space for me. So he says, oh my Lord, there's no space. I went, I checked, no space. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says again, اِذْهَبْ فَادْخُلِ الْجَنَّةِ Go back and go into paradise. The same thing happens again. Right? He goes, he assumes there's no space for him. He comes back, Ya Rabbi, oh my Lord, it's full. There's no space for me. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He asks him that, do you remember? Do you remember the life of the dunya that you used to have? He says, yes. I remember that life. So then Allah says to him, Tamanna. Fayatamanna. So Allah says to him, make a wish is the I mean the wrong translation, but you know, like okay, that'll be a simple Englishman term or layman's English. Make a wish. Right? So then he makes a wish. He thinks of something. So Allah tells him, Do you remember your earthly life? He says, Yes. Alright, so make a wish. And he, he does so. He now is wishing to Allah, right? And of course, he's probably wishing, I wish I can be in that paradise, right? So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَيُقَالُ لَهُ Allah then says to this man, فَإِنَّ لَكَ الَّذِي تَمَنَّ For you is whatever you have wished for. Whatever you have wished for, وَعَشَرَةَ أَضْعَفِ الدُّنْيَا and ten times the size of the earthly life, the dunya that you had. Whatever you're wishing for, you'll get it in paradise. You think that there is no space in Jannah, but for you, you will have a space equal to the size of ten earths. Look at the size of the whole earth. 
This is the very last man entering paradise, brothers and sisters. Right? The absolute last person. His face in Jannah is equal to 10 earths. Subhanallah. Now imagine the one who's going there before him. This is the last guy. There is no one else after him. So then he says uh, that or Are you mocking me? Are you laughing at me? He thinks Allah is joking with him. Like what do you mean? I'm going to have the space of 10 earths? Are, is this a joke? But then of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, this is the truth. <coughs> and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was telling us this incident, again, his, he laughed so big that we could see his molar teeth. Because again, it's an issue of uh, the akhirah. So there is obviously lots of hope that we read this hadith from Sahih Muslim, that this is the very last person. This is what Allah will give him. The size of 10 earths. This is how big his property in Jannah will be. Right? So, Jannah is not limited in space. There's another hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. When every single person is in Jannah, including this last guy, Allah will look that there is still space in Jannah. So he will create some new humans just for, to fill up the space in Jannah. It's unlimited space, right? For every person in the dunya, after they go there, there is still some space left, right? So subhanAllah, this is something that imagine, the big motivation is that the last person, absolute last person gets this much. So what about the one who goes before him? And especially those who are from the first of the people to enter paradise, which is what we want to aim for bi idnillah. So <coughs> we see clearly that the Prophet ﷺ smiled about dunya issues and he laughed about akhirah issues, good news from the akhirah. But of course, when he would recite verses of adab, he would describe uh, jahannam and things like that, he would be crying, right? You could see the reactions. If he's talking about jannah, if he's talking about uh, rewards in hereafter, he would be filled with a big anhu. He says, uh, he narrates to us uh, a story of Ali ibn Abi Talib when Ali was the Khalifa, and this is collected in, a, in the Sunan of a Tirmidhi. Ali ibn Rabia brought a horse to Ali radiallahu anhu. Right? This is a new horse for the Khalifa. So as Ali radiallahu anhu stepped uh, to get up on the horse, you know, uh, the seat that's on the horse. So as he mounted the horse, he said, Bismillah. So he took his first step, and as he was getting up, he said, Bismillah. And then, uh, after he got up to the horse, uh, Ali radiallahu anhu, he said, Subhanalladhi sakhkara lana hadha, wa ma kunna lahu muqrineen, wa inna ila rabbina lamun qalibun. He praised or glorified Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Subhanallah, glory be to Allah. It is He who has blessed me with this ride. Right? And to Him I shall, or we shall return. And then He said, Alhamdulillah, three times. Then He said, Allahu Akbar, three times. And after that, He said, Subhanaka inni zalamtu nafsi, faghfirli, fa innahu la yaghfiru dunuba illa ant. Then he said, so after saying Alhamdulillah three times, he said Allahu Akbar three times, and then he said, indeed, I, have done, I am from the wrongdoers, I have done wrong, forgive me, for no one can forgive except for you. And then Ali radiallahu anhu gave a big smile and a laugh. So Ali ibn Rabia, he was asking, why are you smiling? You're just making adhkar, you're just making a dua, so why are you laughing, right? He asked, that min ayyi shay'in dahikat ya amir al amir al mu'minin o leader of the believers why are you smiling what has made you laugh so ali radiyallahu anhu he said ra'aytu rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sana'a kama sana'tu thumma dahika i saw allah's messenger doing exactly what you saw me doing as he rode on his new or rode on his new 
beast, he said this exact same dua and he also smiled big. So I am doing the exact same thing. This is how the Sahaba used to follow the Sunnah. This is the meaning of loving the Prophet ﷺ. Ali radiallahu anhu laughed at the exact moment that the Prophet was laughing. And this is something, of course, we don't ha ride horses and donkeys and camels anymore, uh, right? That's a, uh, it's a tourist attraction, right? You would go to Egypt or some other Arab country or Pakistan or something. It's a fun activity to ride camels. <laughs> we ride cars and planes and everything. But the sunnah is still the sunnah. Before you get into your car, as you're mounting your car, you say Bismillah. And you say this dua, Subhanallah di sakhra lana hada wa ma kunna lahu mukrinin wa inna ila rabbina lamun qalibun. Right? As you sit in your car. All of you, your, you, your wife, your children, they have to know this dua. You remind yourself that this car, it came to you only because Allah gave it to you. Every time you're sitting, you are reminding yourself, Bismillah, that's the first thing. In the name of Allah, I'm getting in my car. Then you're saying this, Subhanallah, glory be to Allah for giving me this car. And then you're saying, right? That, Wa inna ila rabbina lamun qalibun. Indeed, to our Lord we will return. You're reminding yourself. Allah forbid if you have a car accident and you die, motorcycle accident, you die, whatever it is, you're reminding yourself. The last thing you're saying as you start your journey, we belong to Allah, we will return to Him. The same thing. How many people do we know from the companions, they fell off their horse and died, right? One of the most famous ones, Ummu Haram. She fell off her uh, horse as she was getting out from uh, the ship into, uh, with the soldiers of, that conquered Cyprus. Uh, she fell off and broke her neck and died, right? So same thing. People used to fall off their camels and horses back then and die. Today, people fall off their motorcycles, cars and airplanes, crash and they die. So it is from the sunnah that you say this dua when you ride your vehicle, right? Whatever it is that you're riding. And you recognize Allah's blessings upon you, that Allah is the one who blessed you with this car. Even if it's old, right? A lot of times people's first cars are old, used cars. They might, I got a junk. No, still praise Allah. You have a mode of transportation. If you are happy with Allah, you're always making shukr to Allah, Allah will put the barakah in your wealth and soon you can buy yourself a nice uh, newer car. No problem, right? Or newer vehicle. Not an issue. So this is something, and by the way, that's a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's an authentic hadith that a good ride is better than the ride that doesn't work. Or a healthy camel is better than the one that is sick. Right? Because when you, that is your transportation. You're going to work. You take your family out. You go to groceries. You come to masjid. This is your daily life. Everybody will enjoy a nice working car, right? A newer car, nice car, whatever it is. Everybody enjoys this. This is no problem. But the point is, make sure you get it in a halal way. You praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're happy with it. Not an issue. No problem whatsoever, right? But this, the point is, follow this sunnah. And we see from Ali radiallahu anhu, when he made this dua, he smiled big because that's what he saw the Prophet ﷺ smile. Now why did the Prophet ﷺ smile? Because at the end of the dua, that Subhanaka, inni zalamtu nafsi, faghfirli, fa innahu la yaghfiru dhunuba illa ant, illa anta. Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah smiles at the one who says this sentence. So having remembered that, the Prophet ﷺ smiled. Allah gets happy that my slave knows no one can forgive him except me. So Allah smiles at the person when he says this. That inni zalamtu nafsi faghfirli fa innahu la yaghfiru dhunuba illa anta. He affirms, he knows fully that absolutely no one can forgive him except me. So Allah loves this. Even though this person is a sinner, he has fallen into sin, but now he's making the tawbah, and he's asking Allah, forgive me. No one can forgive me except you. So Allah smiles at this person. That's why the Prophet ﷺ, as he was saying this dua, this part, 
he put a big smile. That me saying this, Allah is happy with me. So he also got very happy. Right? So this is why Ali radiallahu anhu made it sure to explain to the people that exactly at this point, I'm also smiling. Because this is what the Prophet sallallahu explained. Right? So this is how we have to be. You look at from uh, the scholars of hadith, when you read their biographies, anytime they would be teaching hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ would be crying, the teachers also start crying. If it's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ is laughing or smiling, they would be laughing and smiling. Right? This is, we have to train ourselves to be this way. This is the true love of the Prophet ﷺ. That exactly the reactions that he had. We want to make our emotional reactions equal, I mean, equivalent to the way he reacted, right? This is from the Iman, signs of Iman uh, of the believer. So then, uh, the next chapter is about the humor, the sense of humor of the Prophet That we see here. A lot of times people, especially, I, I've met so many people in the, in, in the West, like they have a misconception. If you're someone who is very strict on the sunnah, you can't be smiling at people, you can't have a pleasant face, right? It's like, get away from me, I'm on the sunnah. <laughs> right? No, this is the opposite, right? If you're following the sunnah, you should be a welcoming person. You should be an approachable person, right? And you see what happens to a lot of uh, young people or even elderly people who are ignorant, right? They think that religious life is a very hard life, right? Almost everybody thinks this. Oh no, the person is becoming religious. You must suffer so much, right? And, and subhanAllah, people are so ignorant, right? Uh, uh, this even happened with my wife and all these travels I've done so many, in so many different communities, right? Sometimes sisters will ask, your life must be so sad, you're married to an imam. Like, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> it's like, why do you think this way? But that is how people think religious life is. It's from the shaitan. That they think living a life of sin is so fun, everything fun. But then when you become religious, oh, you can't listen to music, that means your life is dead. It's just one thing, subhanAllah, right? Oh, you can't sing and dance? Oh, your life is so boring. There's so many halal things I'm doing that I can do, no problem, right? So we see here that from the Prophet ﷺ himself, he had a sense of humor. And this is from the sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ, the first hadith that is brought in this chapter, this is narrated by Anas radiallahu anhu. That he said that the Messenger wasallam, <clears throat> that inna nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, قال لي the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم told me يا ذا الأذنين oh the owner of two ears or the possessor of two ears every human has two ears right oh right but this is how who was Anas the servant of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم for ten years right so the Prophet is joking with him. Anytime, the key point here, anytime the Prophet ﷺ said a joke, he never lied, right? Because lying is haram. His jokes would always be truthful matters. So he called Anas, Ya Dal Udunayn. <coughs> Anas was a very attentive listener. This was his characteristic. This is how he memorized so many hadith. Anytime the Prophet ﷺ, usually what happens with servants, Right, especially you brothers and sisters who came from Bangladesh, Pakistan. Maybe in your country you used to have a maid, driver, butler, whatever may be the case. Sometimes you have to repeat the same thing ten times to the maid, and then she'll still screw it up, right? <laughs> but Anas, anything the Prophet said, he wouldn't have to repeat. He was very good listener. So the Prophet is calling him what? Ya dal udunayn. Oh, the possessor of two ears. It's almost like your sense of hearing is so good, it outweighs your other senses. He said it in a joking manner, right? So you can do this. Let's say somebody, uh, is, uh, he's, he walks very fast, right? You can call him, oh, the one with the speedy legs, right? There's nothing wrong with this. 
Like this is not something that you should be offended by if another Muslim says something like this to you. It's a true characteristic, right? Or the one with the strong hands. Maybe somebody has strong hands, something like that, right? It's a, it's a funny way of describing somebody. And it's true, it's not a lie, right? So this is what he did with Anas radiallahu anhu. Because he was somebody who was an attentive listener. Now, check this hadith out. This is collected in Bukhari and Muslim. <laughs> Once a man, <coughs> he came to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he said to the person, uh, uh, or sorry, Anas, this, before I get to that hadith, there's another hadith from Anas. This is important too, let me mention this one. Anas described the Prophet wasallam that the Prophet would mix with us to the point that he even asked my younger brother, Ya Aba Umay, ma fa'ala nughayf. Right? Anas himself was young, he had a younger brother. So the Prophet wasallam would mix with the children to the point that he would ask about them, about their personal life, about their personal belongings. So he asked, Nughayr is a type of bird, it's a small bird. So here the Prophet ﷺ is asking this kid, that day he didn't see the bird with him. Like he used to notice his community members this much, in such details, right? If somebody is missing something, he would ask what happened to this. He would pay attention to every community member. That's a good leader, right? This is the type of leader that Islam requires, that he knows his community, he knows his community members, he sees if something is missing, he'll ask whatever the case may be. And this is a child. So he asked the child, what's up with your bird? Right? Where's your bird? And the Sahaba, they found this astonishing, that this is Allah's messenger. He has so many obligations, yet he noticed that this child one day was without his regular pet bird. So he asked to find out. And he, this child was so, he was shocked. But this is the characteristic of the Prophet ﷺ. Many of us, we don't care to ask the children what's going on, right? Especially when they come to the masjid, if they're doing something, whatever it is. No, ask, talk to the kids, talk to the young girls. The sisters uh, should talk, keep, a, keep an eye on the girls. Get to know your young community. Ask about them, inquire about them. Show them that you love their experience, right? So this is how you have to be. <coughs> From this hadith, we also understand, of course, it's allowed to have pet birds, provided you take care of them, feed them, and everything else properly. And it is allowed for us to call children by a kunya, meaning, a nickname. So here he said, Ya Aba Umayy, ma fa'ala nughayy. Right? He called him. Or look at Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, whose name was Abdul Rahman. That's his real name, Abdul Rahman. Right? But nobody remembers this. Most of the Ummah won't know Abu Huraira's name is Abdul Rahman. But why was he called Abu Huraira? When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa met him, Abu Huraira had a kitten. You know, a baby cat, a kitten in his pocket. And this was his personal kitten. He would always play with it. So the Prophet ﷺ named him father of the kitten. Huraira means kitten, right? So you can nickname your children in this manner. Maybe the kid has a pet hamster. <laughs> you want to call him the father of the hamster, right? Or father of the turtle or whatever may be the case, right? So this is fine. This is all from the sunnah. This is something you're saying to the child in a joking manner because he has this pet he's taking care of this pet or she's taking care of this pet, you can call them father or mother of such and such pet, right? This is from the sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ used to do. In this joking manner, it's from the kind uh, manners. And it was from his characteristic that he would always pay attention to the most weak and vulnerable in the community. Who is the most weak and vulnerable? Children. After that, the women. And we have so many ayat talking about the women. So many ahadith talking about the women. The widow, the yatim, the child, right? Uh, the divorced woman, so on and so forth. Because these two children and women, all over the world till this day, they are the most neglected humans. Any place where you see their suffering, it's always children and women who suffer the most. Look, even in this country, 
what are they, what's going on for the past few months? They're grabbing Mexican children and putting them in prisons. Oh, these are children of illegals. You're caging children. But this is the Western country that promotes freedom and rights. You're imprisoning children, right? But this is the reality of the dunya. Or you look at all these Muslims that are suffering in the different countries. Who is the one suffering the most? Children. Millions of Muslim kids have become yatim because their parents were killed. Bomb, this, that, right? Or look what's happening in China. These Chinese, the Buddhists, or they're communists. The soldiers are coming, taking the Muslim kids from their parents, forcing the children away from their Muslim parents, forcing them to live or grow up as atheists and Buddhists or whatever may be the case, right? They're taking the Muslim women, forcing them to marry Chinese men, right? Forcing them to give up their religion. But who's going to say anything to China? We won't have even an underwear to wear if somebody said something to China, right? But this is the reality of the world we live in. That even today, the most vulnerable people are children and women. And that's why Islam came with so many rights for women and children, to make sure that they are properly cared for, right? Or even the poor people. Like subhanAllah, we see even in masajid, somebody will, you know, the elites of the communities will mock the Muslim woman or man in the community who's poor. Why are you doing this? This is from the worst of sins. How can you mock somebody? Oh, this guy's a freeloader. Oh, he doesn't give money. Subhanallah. Where does it say, <clears throat> how much money did Abu Huraira donate? But he is the one who narrated the highest number of a hadith. He was so poor, he used to sleep in the masjid. So we have to understand. But then there were companions like Abdurrahman ibn Auf, companions like Uthman. They were, you know, so much money. They would be the first ones to donate whenever there was a need. Not everybody is going to have the same financial standards. So you have to understand this. You have to understand your community and have rahmah for those who are lesser than you, if you want to put it that way, who seem to be lesser than you, right? So this was from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sunnah. Then Anas radiallahu anhu, uh, or Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu in another hadith collected in a Tirmidhi, once the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said a joke. The joke is not mentioned in this hadith because the reaction of the companions outweighed the actual joke. So it is not narrated. Abu Huraira didn't narrate the actual joke. Rather, he said, Qalu, the, all the companions that were present, Ya Rasulullah, innaka tuda'ibuna. You are joking with us? They found it so astonishing that you are Allah's messenger. Yet you're sitting with us and cracking jokes with us, making us laugh and smile like they found this, wow, like amazing. Right? So Abu Huraira narrated that part. And then he said, the Prophet ﷺ replied to the companions that yes, I am joking with you. However, inni la aqulu illa haqqan. Except I never say anything except the truth. So even though I'm joking, making you smile and laugh, it's a true incident or something that is truthful. That's how I'm making you smile. Now Anas radiallahu anhu, he narrates to us this funny incident that's collected in Abu Dawood and At-Tirmidhi. That a man came, anna rajulan istahmala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Faqala inni hamiluka ala waladi naqa. So the man came and told the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he needs help, he needs transportation. He sees the Prophet ﷺ is sitting on a camel. So this man, he doesn't have any transportation, right? So he's asking the Prophet that I need to use the camel. So, so the Prophet said that, Inni hamiluka ala waladi naqa. I'll give you a baby camel. This is a full grown man, right? Asking the Prophet, I need a ride. I, I don't have any transportation. So the Prophet is replying to him, I'll give you a baby camel. So this Sahabi, he said, فَقَالَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ مَا أَصْنَعُ بِوَلَدِي وَلَدِ النَّاقَةِ How can I, a full-grown man, sit on the baby camel? <laughs> right? 
<laughs> so the Prophet ﷺ then replied, وَهَلْ تَلِدُ الْإِبِلَ إِلَّا نُوَاقُ Isn't every grown camel first a baby camel? So he was joking with him, right? So he wants a camel to ride. He says, okay, I'll give you a baby camel. Like, how can I fit on a baby camel? Then he's saying, well, the grown camel originally was a baby camel. Right? So I'm not lying. It, it used to be a baby camel at some point. Right? So this was his sense of humor. So then the man uh, understood. <coughs> In another incident, subhanAllah, Anas radiallahu anhu again narrates that there was a Bedouin by the name of Zahir radiallahu anhu. And Zahir, he was a Bedouin, so he used to live in the desert. He would come to Medina from far away. Whenever he came to Medina, Zahir would bring gifts from his Bedouin tribe for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa This was out of his respect. Anytime he's coming to visit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he would come with a gift. And anytime he left Medina back to his tribe, because Zahir would come, bring his goods. He was basically a, a, a merchant. So he would bring his stuff. Medina is the city. This is what happens. You go from a small place, you go to the big town to sell stuff, right? Every businessman to this day, from a small place, they go to the big place because that's where the population is, right? This is a successful businessmen do that. It's all about location, right? They'll even teach you. If you want to open a store, it's about location, right? So this is how the people work. This is the nature of human beings. If you want to succeed in business, this is common sense. Whatever you want to sell, make sure there's the proper population to support that. Otherwise, you know, you won't make much profit or make money at all. So Zahir used to come from his, from the outskirts as a Bedouin, uh, and then he'd come and uh, do his job, sell his goods, give some gifts to the Prophet uh, وسلم, and then he would return. When he used to return, the Prophet would also give him a gift on his way back. He accepted gifts and then he also gave gifts, right? So one time, uh, and, and then the Prophet وسلم, he mentioned to the other companions about Zahir, that inna zahiran badiyatuna wa nahnu hadihuhu that Zahir is our, uh, is our, you know, village or our desert. Uh, Zahir is our desert and we are his city. Because he's coming from the desert, brings gifts. And then when he goes back, we also give him gifts. So we are his city and he's our desert. So this is the title that the Prophet ﷺ had given to Zahir. Now Anas radiallahu anhu makes a very good point here, which will make sense at the end of the story. Uh, how about you two kids run around in the back room upstairs, inshallah. <clears throat> so, uh, Anas said that this was the title that the Prophet gave to Zahir. Right? And Anas then says that he said this about Zahir, even though Zahir himself, he was somebody who was not uh, pleasant to look at. Right? He was not somebody pleasant to look at. He had uh, physical defects. Zahir was somebody with a lot of physical defects. Anas wasn't saying this to criticize Zahir, but he wanted to show, he made this point, that this is how much the Prophet honored Zahir. Even though an average person would look at a disabled, defective human being and be like, eh, he's ugly, his limbs are weird looking and this and that. But the Prophet ﷺ valued him, honored him, and even gave him this nice uh, uh, title that he is our desert and we are his city, right? So one day when Zahir came, he was in the market of Medina selling his things. The Prophet ﷺ heard that he was here. So the Prophet ﷺ went to the marketplace. He saw Zahir. He went from the back of Zahir. And the Prophet ﷺ grabbed Zahir from the back, from his arms, from the back. He quickly grabbed him. Now Zahir has no idea who this is. Again, the Prophet ﷺ, this is his sense of humor. He's playing a joke, right? He grabs Zahir by the back with his arms like this. So then Zahir's like, uh, he's asking, who is it? Man hada irsilni, man hada irsilni. Who's this? Who's this? Free me. Let me go. Let me go. 
Then he finally saw that it's the Prophet ﷺ. So when he saw that, he straightened his back so it can touch the chest of the Prophet ﷺ. He wanted to get more blessings, barakah from the touch of the Prophet ﷺ, right? So he straightened his back and he made sure that his back touched the chest of the Prophet ﷺ. And then the Prophet says, I'm still holding him, right? Still holding him. And again, this is the marketplace. So the Prophet ﷺ raised his voice a little bit. <coughs> and he said, Man yashtari hadha al-abd. Who is going to buy this slave? <laughs> Who's going to buy this slave? But of course, he wasn't a slave, right? But this is the joke that I caught. Who's going to buy this slave from me? So Zahir then, subhanAllah, he said to the Prophet ﷺ that no one's gonna buy me. I am defective. Physically, I am defective. So the Prophet ﷺ, he told him that Lakin in the Allahi Lasta be kasid. With Allah, you're not defective. Then, you know, Zahir, of course, uh, you know, this, this is subhanAllah. Like again, we see from the rahmah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he's pr playing this joke. It pranked him. That's that's the word I was looking for. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam pranked Zahir radiallahu anhu, and he's even passing out this joke. Who wants to buy this slave? Now he calls Zahir a slave. Is this a lie? No. no. Why not? He's a slave of Allah. There you go. So even when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam joked. Maybe at face value, someone would not understand. But he did not lie. Zahir really is an abd. He's Abdullah. All of us are the slaves of Allah, right? So it wasn't like he was mocking him or criticizing him or saying something false, right? But he really was a slave of Allah. So that's what he said. Who wants to buy this slave? Meaning the slave of Allah, right? You can withhold some parts of the information to fulfill the joke, no problem, right? But you don't completely switch the meaning and turn it into a lie. This is what we see from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I'll end with one more hadith. Uh, so something for the sisters too inshallah. And then we will conclude for tonight and have the questions. Once that old lady came to the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and she said, Ya Rasulullah, Allah an yudkhilani al-jannah. O Allah's messenger, Please make dua to Allah that I can go to Jannah. She's a very old lady. <laughs> so the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Umm al-Fulan, O mother of so and so, right? Uh, o mother of so and so, because this is the way, uh, would go by the kunya. So whatever her uh, child's name was, so O mother of so and so, Inna al-Jannata la tadkhuluha ajuz. Old women don't enter paradise. <laughs> so this is the Prophet ﷺ. This old lady came and saying, make dua, I can go to Jannah. And he's saying, old women don't go to Jannah. <laughs> so then this woman, uh, she turned around, she started crying and walking away. Man. I, I failed, right? I wanted to go to Jannah. I'm asking the Prophet, but he just said, old women can't go to Jannah, right? So then he said, Akhbiruha that anna la tadkhuluha wa hiya ajuz. She will not enter paradise as an old woman. But then he recited the ayah from, uh, ayat from uh, Surah Waqiyah. That inna ansha'nahunna ansha'a faj'alnahunna abkara Uruban uh, Atraba. That these women of paradise, they will be young virgins. So he recited the ayat. Then the woman understood that there's no room for old women in Jannah. You'll be young, you'll be full of strength. And this is another hadith in collected in Tirmidhi. Every single person in Jannah will be 33, 34 years of age. Right? So you and your great-grandfather will be the same age. You and your father and mother and brothers and sisters and children. Everyone will be 33, 34 years of age in Jannah. So that's what he meant. There's no room for old women in Jannah. Now why do you think Allah will keep everybody at this age? 33, 34 years of age. 
a healthy human being even in this dunya that is the prime of their youth that is the strongest most active you want to enjoy paradise for the rest of eternity that's why subhanallah al hakim gives us this age so even somebody may die at the age of 80 and inshallah he goes to jannah he will be 33 or 34 years of age so this is what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told this old woman but the point is look how he joked and smiled right it's the truthful information he didn't lie but it was a joke and it was something to laugh and smile about this is the sunnah of joking and you see here even the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam even in his jokes it's funny but there are points of benefit like look at here he's telling this old woman no room for jinn but then he's reciting ayat to explain that it is kind of funny Right, so he would give points of benefit. People would uh, would benefit uh, from him, even in, even through his uh, jokes. So, inshallah Taala, we'll stop here for tonight. We have about twenty minutes until Aisha. So, uh, your questions. I already got one question uh, uh, here. <coughs> I'll check online too, inshallah. <coughs> So the question here is, is, is the Prophet ﷺ alive in his grave? And the second question is, did he see Allah in the mihraj? Uh, this is of course a, a very important aqidah issue. There are many people uh, who claim to be Muslim, that they, are, they believe that the Prophet ﷺ is hadir nadir, that he is omnipresent, right? He's always present everywhere uh, because he's a witness over the people, a witness over the deeds. He's going to come and testify on people's behalf on Yom Al-Qiyamah, so on and so forth. So they use this type of logic to think that the Prophet ﷺ is still alive and he's omnipresent. And of course, this is uh, Rabi Al-Awwal. Right now, we're going to see so much bid'ah happening very soon. Uh, people doing the mawlid. Some people, subhanAllah, I've seen in their maulid gatherings, they even put the chair there as they're singing and dancing. They're thinking the ruh of the Prophet is going to come and sit on the chair. Right? These type of beliefs are kufr. The, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, He told us in the Quran, He addressed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa directly in this ayah, that innaka mayyitun wa innahum mayyitun. Indeed, you will die talking to the Prophet ﷺ. And they too, meaning all the other people, they will also die. So this is a direct ayah in the Qur'an. Allah telling the Prophet directly before his death that you will die and so will every other person. Or uh, in another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, He mentioned that, وَمَا جَعَلْنَا لِبَشَرٍ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ الْخُلْدِ No human being before you was given eternal life. Every human being died. Nobody got eternal life that they're going to live forever. Right? So if you die, are they going to live forever? So another ayah. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly tells us in the Quran that the Prophet wasallam was Bashar. He was a human being just like all of us. But he's special because he's Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But it doesn't mean he's alive. He, he passed away. He died. And you look at after the Prophet ﷺ died, <coughs> when Abu Bakr became the Khalifa, what was the first thing? And this is the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim and others. When Umar was so emotional that the Prophet died, Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, if anybody dare says Muhammad mat, I'm going to chop your head off. Don't you dare say that the Prophet ﷺ died. He was so emotional, Umar radiallahu anhu. He didn't even want to hear anybody say that the messenger has died. But then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he came out. He said, Inna alhamdulillah, you know, he stood up for the khutbah. He stood on the minbar and he called out to the whole people. And what did he say to the people? That man kana ya'budu muhammadan, then fa inna, uh, fa inna muhammadan qad mat. Whoever used to worship Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa then know that Muhammad has died. وَمَنْ كَانَ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهِ And whoever worships Allah, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ حَيٌّ لَا يَمُوتِ 
that Allah is the ever living, He never dies. So this statement from Abu Bakr is a profound statement. If you worship your, the Prophet, your God has died. But if you worship Allah, then He is al Hayy, the ever living. He does not die. Focusing our message or taking the focus of the Muslims that remember who you are, what your aqidah is. We worship Allah, not Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa right? So uh, this is very clear that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is not alive. And this is a major, major aqidah issue, right? Only people uh, who fall into this major shirk, you'll find certain people, they make dua to Rasulullah. That, Ya Rasulullah, give me this, give me that. This is shirk of the worst kind. What's the difference between this person with a Muslim name and a Christian here who's saying, Oh Jesus, Oh Mary, is the exact same thing. They're saying Jesus, which is a Rasul of Allah. You're saying Muhammad, which is also a Rasul of Allah. You don't worship Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa You're supposed to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the meaning of La ilaha illallah. Now the second question, did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam see Allah in the Mi'raj? Our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, she made it very clear in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, anyone who says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw Allah is a liar when he went to the Mi'raj. Okay? In the dunya life, no one can see Allah. No one. So that was still the dunya life. Inshallah, in the akhirah, Ahlul Jannah will be able to see Allah. That's the biggest gift in paradise, to see Allah physically, what He, find, what he looks like, right? But in the dunya life, before the day of judgment, nobody has seen Allah, not even the Prophet ﷺ. And our mother Aisha made it very clear. If anyone says that he saw Allah in the Mi'raj, huwa kadhab. He is a liar. Okay? He is a liar. No truthful person will say such a thing. Uh, you have a question, brother? Yeah. So, uh, talk about love, loving, but love, smile, love. Inside the, the, the salah, what is that? Talking about what? Praying. And yeah. If you love, like, or make kafah or something like that, what is that? I we hear like uh, if you make a uh, big love inside the, when you're praying. Oh, when you're laughing in the salat? Yeah. yeah. So what happens like uh, so, <laughs> Well, I, I, well I would, you know, of course you can't lose your khushu in that manner. Okay. You don't laugh or smile in the salat, right? So that's not a place. You, you just say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. Do nafath to your left side like don't spit on the brother next to you. Nafat, you blow, blow spittle, right? So anytime you lose khushu in salah, this is what the Prophet ﷺ taught us. So you pray, you look to your left, you say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. You move your lips, you say it to yourself. Then you look to your left three times, and this is how get, you get your khushu back, inshallah. So that's what you're supposed to do. No, no, no. Laughing does not break your wudu, right? If you laugh, it does not break your wudu. Right? You, so we hear like that if you are praying and you love like that, then you. No, no, there is absolutely no hadith saying uh, in that situation if you're laughing, you break your wudu. Right? So that's not uh, true. All right, another question. Oh, yeah, brother. Okay. While we're praying, if we got sinned, do we have to say Alhamdulillah? No, no. Uh, the brother is asking if you sneeze in your salah. You are supposed to cover, try to block it as much as you can, but if suppose it comes out out loud, you don't break the salah and say Alhamdulillah, right? This is actually a hadith in Sahih Muslim. Muawiyah ibn al-Hakam, when he became a new Muslim, a few group of, this is a fairly lengthy hadith, and one of the most important aqidah issues in, is in this hadith, but that can be a different topic. But the hadith started with, Somebody sneezed, and then the Sahaba said, Ya Allah, and they're, <laughs> they're but they were new Muslims. So the Prophet ﷺ explained after the Salah, you don't say Alhamdulillah when you sneeze in your Salah, or somebody else doesn't say Ya Allah, and so on and so forth. You just block your sneeze as much as you can, and you just stay quiet, you're in Salah, okay? <coughs> Who? Oh, oh, yeah. 
did Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ever pray while he was on top of the camel? Yeah, you can pray. The uh, brother is asking about did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ever pray while riding his camel? Any uh, nafila salah, right? Not fard salah. You want to pray in your car, not while driving. <laughs> Don't drive and pray and then get into a crash and die, right? But let's say you're a passenger in the car. You just want to pray two rakah, okay? No problem. It's a, it's a, a nawafil. You can pray sitting down, no problem. The Prophet ﷺ prayed while sitting on his camel, but that was a nafila, not a fard salah. Fard salah, you cannot pray sitting unless you are physically incapable. You, there's something wrong with you physically. You have to pray standing for the one who is able to pray standing. Uh, I'll take y y your question. Um, can I do a question from last week? Can you do what? Can you do a question from last week? A question from last week? Yeah, you, you forgot the question? No problem. Go ahead. Um, Yeah, so our young brother is asking if a homeless person asks for a burger, can you give the burger to the homeless person? Of course, you buy him the food, give him, and inshallah, you'll get a reward. No problem, right? Uh, he raised his hand first. Let me see. Yeah, brother. <coughs> uh, my question is, uh, Dunkin' Donut, uh, that is with uh, jelly and ice cream, that is the mother of folks, as well. Uh, they have the jelly inside this kind of food here. Are you the jelly? I think the brother is asking about gelatin. Yeah. yeah, gelatin is inshallah no problem. It is uh, halal to eat, not an issue with foods that have gelatin. Uh, because the point is, <clears throat> let's suppose the gelatin. This is a, a uh, this is a very f well known principle in fiqh. The example. Many, like this is what we have in our books, that the scholars of the past gave this example. <coughs> Let's say you have a pile of salt, huge pile of salt. A pig died in that salt, decomposed, years and years passed by, decomposed, completely turned into salt. That salt is still halal, because the pig has disappeared. That compound is completely gone, it has changed to something else, right? So when, it, when something changes from one thing to another thing, the ruling also changes. Just like a human being. A man was a kafir yesterday, today he took the shahada, he's now our Muslim brother. Do we say, oh, you're a kafir still? No, he used to be a kafir. He took a shahada, he has changed into something completely different, which is Muslim. So he takes the rulings of a Muslim. So same thing with gelatin. Even if it came from pork, it is not pork, it is not pig. Nobody calls this pig. It's even a different name, gelatin. It's a different chemical formula. Everything is completely different, right? So this is why it is halal. But if you see, let's say you read the ingredients, it says pork gelatin. Don't eat that because of the word pork in the ingredients. This goes against, you know, I see the word pork. But in the ingredients, like let's say the starburst candy, gummy bears, uh, uh, sour patch, all these other candies, if you read the ingredients, it simply says gelatin. No problem. Right? No problem whatsoever. You can eat this inshallah ta'ala. So the gelatin uh, in the donuts, it just says gelatin there. In the jelly, whatever it is, you can eat this. Because this is a completely separate compound, an element. Even the name is completely different. So don't worry about it inshallah ta'ala. Uh, you can eat this. Yeah, 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 same thing. You know, same thing. This is how it is. Uh, yeah. How about the marshmallows? Yeah, marshmallows are made of gelatin too. Right, so no problem. You want to have a, a bonfire in your backyard. This type of American culture is fine to follow, no problem, right? This is the American culture. You sit in the backyard in the summertime, maybe a bunch of kids come, you have a bonfire. There's nothing wrong uh, with these cultural aspects. We don't have anything saying, oh, you can't have bonfires. This is not from the Pakistani culture or Bengali culture. No, this is just food and a way of eating, right? So uh, marshmallows are, are fine too because it's, it's it will say gelatin, whatever may be the case. So not an issue, inshallah. Yeah, brother. Here, shh, shh, I can't. My question is from Eric, the first question, which is the Prophet, he died, like he was a Russian. So when he 
went to the, the what is it called? Mirage, and he met with all the different prophets, prophet, like prophet Musa, prophet Ibrahim, prophet yeah. Yusuf. So when he had a meeting with them, they were like in a human body or something, or was it like a different situation? So he, okay, so the brother is asking about the aspect of the Mi'raj when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Jannah at the different levels saw different prophets. That's the key there. Where were they? No, no, no. In Jannah. Is that the dunya? There, that's the very first point. That they're in paradise. And this is from Allah. Uh, he, he can do whatever He wants. Right? And he does uh, wa yaf'alu ma yurid. Right? What, he does whatever he wills. So Allah caused this miracle to happen in that journey. But even then, this was something that the Prophet ﷺ allowed. This was, a, I'm sorry, Allah made it happen for that special reason. There was the wisdom. He talked with these prophets in the different levels of paradise. And, and the same thing, let's say, in Baytul Maqdis, he led all the prophets in prayer. Right? This is a special case. He, this is a special case. You cannot take a special case and generalize the entire concept. So that means they are not in their graveyards, not in the prophets. No, no, their bodies, when everybody dies, they go into the barzakh phase, right? You're, they're there. They're still in their graves. Uh, the prophet's bodies are exactly intact the way it was because that's a miracle from Allah. The earth does not eat the body of the prophets. Their bodies do not decompose. So if somebody, no one's going to do this, no one's they'll be probably shot and killed before somebody tries this. But if somebody wants to dig up the Prophet's grave, you would see him exactly how he was while living. This is a miracle only for the NBA. The earth does not eat their skin and their bones. Exactly intact. Every single Prophet, wherever they may be, buried. But they have died, they're buried. Uh, uh, Allah willed for them to meet with the Prophet and the Prophet to meet them during that journey of Mi'raj. That journey of Isra wal Mi'raj in and of itself, you look at the entire context of the story or the incident, the entire incident A to Z is a miracle. You have to understand this. This is not a normal thing that happened. It is not something that happens every day to every human being. And it did not even happen to any other Prophet before the Prophet ﷺ, right? So this is a special miracle that was just for him, right? Allah willed for it to happen and the details, which of course we can inshallah uh, give a lecture on that and go into further details. But this is one of the miracles of Allah and it was a specific miracle for a specific incident. We can't generalize and say this is ongoing. Okay. Uh, so this is the special event for Ava. Oh, right? oh yeah, that, that's for him. That was the only once, first and last time it happened. That's it, no one else uh, is that. Okay, another question we got. <coughs> Let me take a question from the sisters on the... Uh, well, I think this was somebody probably yesterday, uh, present yesterday. The person got confused. Okay, there was a, a question was uh, put forth. This was actually a program that we had last night. Uh, somebody had asked about uh, here. Sh hey, hey, teenage boys. Yeah, the three-year-old is different, but you guys stay quiet. <coughs> uh, a question was put forth last night: If it's halal to offer salah inside casinos, so I think. Uh, a couple of the sisters are confused, so they're asking now to repeat the answer. <clears throat> so as I was saying, that of course we have many ahadith, like for example, uh, the Prophet wasallam, he made it very clear, uh, here, shh, shh, uh, quiet, so just so everybody understands this. Of course we have hadith in Bukhari, Muslim and others, for example, where the Prophet wasallam. He made it very clear that وَجُعِلَتْ لِيَ الْأَرْضُ مَسْجِدًا وَطَهُورًا That the whole earth has been made a place of a masjid and a means by which you can make tayammum. Right? This is what it means, tahura. Meaning you, if you don't have water available, you touch the earth, you make tayammum. Right? You can do this. 
the grass, the field, whatever it is, if you have no access to water. You're allowed to do this. Allah has blessed this Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to do this. And he also said, anywhere in, the, in this earth, it's, it's a masjid, meaning if it's time for salah, you can pray. There are other ahadith in Abu Dawood, at tirmidhi where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he made uh, an exception to that rule. Like the hadith in, uh, in Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah and At-Tirmidhi, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said uh, in that hadith that Al-Ardu Kulluha Masjidun, Masjidun. The whole earth is a masjid. Illa Al-Hammam, except for the bathroom, wa uh, wal uh, maqbura and the graveyard. So there's two exceptions, except for the bathrooms and the graveyards. This is not a place where you pray. So the whole earth is a place of prayer, except for the graveyard and the bathroom. And of course we have ayat and we have other hadith. You cannot pray in a place of shirk, right? You cannot play, pray. So I give the example, let's suppose in many countries they have the mazar, right? Uh, whether you're from Bangladesh or Pakistan or Egypt or wherever you are, there's different Muslim countries that have shrines. You cannot go next to the shrine and pray there because that is a whole area dedicated to shirk. This is a filthy place. It is not befitting that you worship Allah in a filthy place. Right? So that we have Dalil from the Quran and the Sunnah. Then we have Hammam is again a filthy place. Uh, the graveyard is the place of the dead. You don't make ruku and sujood. Again, this is, if, if you're not allowed to pray in the graveyard, how can you pray in front of the shrine? That's a grave right there, right? So this is the same point. Now, when it comes to filthy places, we have the Prophet Wasallam made it very clear uh, in other hadith that you cannot pray in a place or you should not pray in a place that will distract you. You cannot or should not pray in a, a, a place that will distract you. And that hadith is uh, narrated by Uthman radiallahu anhu. When a woman came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa she had uh, qarnayn, horns of rams of her animal that was in there. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told her, told Uthman to tell her that she shouldn't pray there. Remove that thing. Uh, because it will act as a distraction and then she can pray. So Uthman radiallahu anhu, he had forgotten that to tell that lady but then called her back. And then he told her that I, I forgot to give this message to you. And Uthman radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa made it very clear that لَيْسَ يَنْبَغِي أَنْ يَكُونَ فِي الْبَيْتِ شَيْءٌ يَشْغُلُ الْمُصَلِّ That you cannot pray in an area that will distract the person who's praying. So let's say the casino floor, because that was the specific question that was asked yesterday. The casino floor, chiching, 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 the slot machine noise, this noise, music, half-naked women, this, that. This is a filthy place. Distraction upon distraction upon distraction, right? So you look at the context and you look at all these ahadith. You cannot pray. Uh, you should not be pr you should not be working there to for, the, to begin with, and may Allah guide you away from this type of job. But if you are there, pray outside. We're not saying you miss a lot. Don't be like, ah, I work in a casino, I shouldn't work, pray at all. No, that's kufr. Working in a casino is from the kabair, but not praying is kufr. This is far worse, right? So you should pray when it's time for the salah, but go somewhere else, maybe inside the office or outside the building in the grass, in the street, or something like that in the parking lot. So uh, he can go to the parking lot in his car so he can... Yeah, pray. yeah, okay, not sitting in the car. You cannot pray for salah sitting unless you are physically disabled, right? But you can stand in the parking lot, pray. You want to go upstairs in the hotel rooms if there's an empty space where the rooms are, no problem. But the casino floor, no, you, can, you should not be praying uh, there, okay? So hopefully this is clear uh, today, and hopefully it's clear. Uh, for uh, the, the sisters who asked. All, another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, or, or Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he made it very clear that Nuhitu, <coughs> Nuhitu an usalliya khalfal, uh, that we have been forbidden by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to pray behind mutahadithina wa niya. 
people who are talking, do not pray next to them. It is makruh because the talking will distract you. This is regular talking. Right? So there's many a hadith that we can say that you're not supposed to be praying at a place where you will get distracted by the kalam of people. And especially haram things like music, half-naked women, and all this stuff, right? So this is not befitting for you to worship Allah in a filthy environment, right? It is makruh, it is disliked. Uh, so inshallah ta'ala, avoid this. Okay, one last question and, and then we'll pray. You have a question? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, we have a uh, Bangladesh uh, in the mas ma uh, madrasa and masjid next to the graveyard. Close it. How is, is, is it okay or not? No, the brother's asking about maybe they they have a they have a madrasa and a masjid in Bangladesh that's next to a graveyard. This is something culturally speaking, many people they think if you build a masjid, there has to be a graveyard right behind it. This came from Sufism. Okay, this is the poison that they slowly injected. That you have a masjid, right behind it is a graveyard, and then slowly they'll take one, one of the graves and put it inside the masjid. Right? This is what happens. So a graveyard is not connected with the masjid whatsoever. There has no relationship. Uh, but if there happens to be that type of situation, there has to be a clear uh, boundary between the graveyard and the masjid, right? So build a fence, thick walls, whatever it is. Separate the property of the graveyard from the masjid. It cannot be one whole property. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Uh, so that would be the way to do it. So set up a fence or a wall and separate it, inshallah. So there's some, some mosques, they build it up. Yeah, the, the graveyard is in front, so what's gonna be happening? Yeah, they have to separate with walls. Yeah, but, uh, they have to make a wall. Yeah, they have to make a wall, clearly separate between the grave and the masjid. Okay, inshallah. Yeah. You ask me a question later. Sure, just clear them, you know, because they always say the Prophet Muhammad had a roda inside the masjid, but yes. tell them, you know, in this time it was not. Cool. Yeah, the roda is a place of Jannah, that's not his grave. Yeah, so that was also the house of Aisha Okay, all right, give then and then we'll turn this over to you.